This is a true story. When I was about six years old, my sister was five. Uh, we were at my grandma's house in Waynesville, Ohio, where we often uh, were. And it was, uh, she lived in an old two-story Victorian home, you know, with a real tall ceilings. And my sister and I were in an upstairs bedroom playing in one of the rooms right in front of a window, a window that they had freshly put a new screen in. Windows were up. You could feel the breeze coming through the house. And my sister and I sat on a, a toy box right in front of that window. Her back was to it. I was in front of her. And we had a book that we were, that I wanted and my sister wanted as well. And so we started, like kids do, we started that, that tug of war over, over the object. And, and my sister would say, it's mine. And she'd pull it real hard. And I'd say, it's mine. And I would pull it real hard. And we went back and forth this way. Mine, mine, mine. And, and, and all of a sudden, it was her turn, you know, to tug real hard. And I just timed it perfectly. And she goes, mine. Whoop. And out the screen, out the window, down two stories. Bam, right onto the ground. She could have been hurt really bad that day. And thankfully, she's totally fine. She just got a sprained arm out of it. But my mom could have killed me when she found out all of the details that happened. But like moms so graciously are, after the discipline phase, she let me know I was forgiven. And, uh, and, and, and that's really what we're going to land on today, this idea of forgiveness. It's, it's so important so important. We all need it. We all need to share it. And it's time and time again what our moms have so graciously given us, even at times when we didn't deserve it. We've been working our way through the Lord's Prayer uh, over the last several months. It's found here in Matthew 6. So if you like, open there with me. Uh, Open your Bible apps as well if you have one of those. Uh, Incredible truths in this prayer. Amazing truths to live by, but often truths that we miss because we're so familiar with them. We just don't even think about them. That's the way it is sometimes when things get too familiar. Look with me at chapter 6, verse 12. These are Jesus' words. Remember, he's teaching us how to pray, and he says here in verse 12, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Something our moms practice again and again, very regularly. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, this is called God's call to forgiveness. God's call to forgiveness. Think about that. Where would we be without forgiveness? Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Sounds like Jesus is talking about finances at first. We do a thorough dive into this passage in the whole rest of the sermon, as well as other gospel accounts like Luke's, and we see things a little bit differently. He's not talking about finances at all. He's talking about debts we have with God, debts we have with others. In Luke's version of the prayer, it says, forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. So this is clearly about forgiveness of sins. And when we understand and experience his forgiveness of all of our sins, a common Christian theme, but when we really truly get it, we grasp it, we know it on a heart level, it really is a game changer. It changes everything. Uh, not only our eternal destination, because now our sins are forgiven, but it changes us individually. I mean, to know that, that we are forgiven by God all of our sins to experience his undeserved compassion and mercy. I mean, that is huge. It's gigantic. I have personally committed innumerable sins. I know sometimes we look at pastors and think they live such pure lives, but I'm a sinner. Apart from Christ, I'm I'm a sinner just like everybody else. I've said things that have hurt people. I've said things as a pastor that have hurt people that I had to go back and apologize and should have apologized for. Uh, I, I've lied to people, not so much as a pastor, but, but I can't say I never have. Uh, I, I know you hate to hear that, but it's just the truth of the matter. Uh, a, a few years bef- after that window incident with my sister, uh, I, I think I told you guys about this. I was on the school bus going home. I was in the third grade, and uh, I found a big, one of those real big thick rubber bands on the floor. And there was a loudmouth girl that was always pestering me in the back. So I just f- stood up in the seat, you know, on my knees, and I looked at her, and I pulled that rubber band back real, real far, and I looked at her, and she looked at me. Don't you even think about it. Wing, wham, right across her face. 
didn't even seem like it bothered her at all. So I thought, huh, maybe I didn't do it hard enough. So what did I do? Two more times. Bling, bling. And people around me are going, oh, oh, ooh. She acted like it didn't even bother her at all. And then I started seeing the tears filling her eyes. And then I saw the red marks begin to raise across her face. And I knew I was in deep trouble. But I've done so many things. Hurt people, said things, thought things. You know, and God has forgiven me all my sins. And he offers forgiveness to all of us. The Bible teaches us that really all of our sin, all of it is against God. And I I do what I want to, when I want, and how I want to, instead of listening to him and doing it his way. He's the one that has my best interest at heart. And yet I have the audacity to do it my way. That's not only disrespect to my creator. That is rebellion. Rebellion against God. And still he continues to extend forgiveness. Which, by the way, cost him greatly. You've heard me say this so many times. But God is holy. God is just. He he has to punish sin. Or he's not a good God. He's not a holy, just God. Enter Jesus, who is sinless, and at the cross, he took on the punishment in our place. All the punishment we deserve for our sin, Jesus, that's what the cross is all about. He's taking the punishment in our place. Jesus took what we deserved on himself so that we could instead be given forgiveness from God the Father. And when we turn to Christ and we put our faith and trust in who he is and what he did for us, we get to experience the compassion. We get to experience the mercy of a good, holy God because he gives us forgiveness. And that is life-changing. It's so life-changing that the compassion and mercy we receive, we begin to share it with others in need those who sin against us. It it allows us to have a life that's more than just getting what we want. It's a life that's all about relationship with our Father in heaven, doing what He wants. And it all starts with God's call to forgiveness. It's foundational. It's how we build a life that really is truly worth living. So how how do we build on that? How how do we, we build? What do we build with? Well, let's look at the next passage. Look at the very next chapter, Matthew 7, verse 12. Same verse, just in the next chapter ahead. Matthew 7, verse 12. Remember, this is all still part of the same sermon that Jesus is preaching called the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 12, he says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And we are familiar with that, huh? That's the golden rule. We've heard this. We've heard our moms tell us about this one. Treat others the way you want to be treated. The golden rule. First, we experience God's undeserved grace, his forgiveness, which enables us to forgive. And now we're equipped to treat others the way we want to be treated. So one of the greatest evidences that proves that we have received and experienced the forgiveness of all our sins from God is that we are able to forgive others, their sins against us. And then on that, from that, we treat others the way we want to be treated. I mean, who among us doesn't want people to forgive us when we mess up? I don't think there's anybody who exists, if they're caught in sin, doesn't think to themselves, man, I hope they'll forgive me. I hope they'll give me a second chance. All of us have thought that. And as God forgives us, we are then given the capacity to forgive others. Then we treat others the way we want to be treated. There's a clear connection here. We see it throughout Scripture and other places as well. Husbands, you're to love your wives the way you love yourself. Which means one of the most powerful and influential weapons that God has is you. You are. You, when you forgive someone who has hurt you or offended you. You, when you treat others the way you want to be treated, even when they don't treat you right. Even ever wish that God would use you in a powerful way. You ever think to yourself, oh, God, just somehow I want you to make a difference through me. 
Here you go. Forgive as he's forgiven you. Treat others the way you want to be treated. God wants this for us. He wants this from us. And when we live this out, it leads to a life that is relational, health, uh, wholeness. It's when we don't do this that things start going south, that things start cracking and fracturing, and things start breaking apart. I, I want you to just imagine. Imagine you're at work. If you're retired, imagine you're, you're back at work. You're, you're working, and you overhear someone talking to a coworker. They don't see you, but they're talking to a coworker. You're hearing them, and, th- and this coworker is upset. They're mad about something you said, something you did against them. A- and they're telling somebody all about it. Now, we're familiar with this, maybe. maybe. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe that's happened to you. And we don't like it, do we? Oh, man, don't talk to them about me. The craziest thing is, is all of us have done it, too. We've talked about others who have hurt us to people who had nothing to do with it. Jesus says, treat others the way you want to be treated. So if we're going to know and experience the life that God wants us to have, where does it start? It starts with us. Us choosing. Now, we have to treat others the way we want to be treated. So this means that when someone does this, you know, with us, what should we do? I'm talking about if they come to us and they start talking about somebody else, what should we do? We should very nicely say, hey, I understand you're upset. I understand that you're angry about this. But really what you should do is go talk to that person, the person who hurt you. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 18. He says, if someone offends you, go talk to them one-on-one. If someone's talking bad about us, it's what we would want them to do. Come talk to us. Let's fix this. Don't go spread this stuff all over the office. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Also, if you do that two or three times, hey, you know, go talk to the person who hurt you. You do that two or three times, guess who will stop coming to you? People who want to tell you all the bad stuff about somebody else because they know what you're going to say. Now imagine if everybody did that. That was the stock answer everybody gave. And then people followed it because that's what they heard over and over. You know what? We would live in a happier world, a healthier society. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Now we do have to be careful here because we can take God's truths and we have this thing in us called the sin nature. We all know it well, very much alive every day. And that sin nature will take the truth of God and it will twist it ever so slightly so that it's used to serve self. Let me explain it this way. There's an elderly man, a father, and uh, he lives in Phoenix. And so he calls up his son who lives in New York and he says, I hate to ruin your day, son, but your mother and I are getting divorced. After 55 years, I've been in misery long enough. I'm out of here. The son says, Dad, Dad, what are you talking about? This is crazy. You're being ridiculous. He says, he says we've, we've, we're sick of each other. We don't even want to talk about it with each other. And I don't want to talk about it with you. So you call your sister in Chicago. You tell her, I'm out of here. And he hangs up the phone. Immediately, the son dials his sister's number. He calls her up in Chicago. You're not going to believe this. Dad says he and mom are divorcing. She says, there is no way. Give me a minute. Let me call him. She gets on the phone to dad. She, Dad, you're not getting divorced. What are you talking about? You're not doing anything until your son, my brother, and I get down there this weekend. He goes, okay, okay. He hangs up the phone, looks at his wife with a big smile and says, okay, we've got him here for Mother's Day. We didn't have to pay for it. How do we get him here for Thanksgiving? <laughs> and it's funny, it's clever, you know, but guess what? That's not treating others the way you want to be treated. That's manipulation. And now some of you might be thinking, come on, it's just a fun story, Vern. It's not that big a deal. And I realize that. But that's the way the sin nature works. It takes God's truth, twists it just a bit, and makes it serve self which doesn't make a happier, healthier world. It makes things messier. 
kind of like the Christian guy who got all ticked off at the guy on the other end of the phone. So, man, he just, he just let him have it. He yelled and screamed on that phone. When it was all over, one of his family members said, Dad, what are you doing? That's horrible. Why were you talking that way? He says, well, well if I did what he did, I would want somebody to talk to me that way too. Really? 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 <laughs> Broke this podium. We can be godly and assertive without ripping somebody a new one, right? That's what God calls us to do. We're to treat others the way we want to be treated. And remember, at the heart of all of this is God's call to forgiveness. He's extended His mercy and His compassion to us over innumerable sins and offenses. And did we deserve His forgiveness, His mercy and compassion? And we begin to see how essential God's truth is, especially in an ever-changing world. I mean, we live in a world where things have gotten so crazy. I, I listen, I hear what's going on, the new thing, and I think to myself, have we lost our minds? Has the world gone mad? You know what we need? We need anchors. We need those, those truth that never changes. Uh, eternally consistent truth that is with us and that has withstood the test of time. That no matter what happens in the world over the millennia, the same truth that's always been the truth. An anchor that no matter what happens, we can run to it because it's always right. We need this because, because without it, what happens? We get lost. We get confused. Things start falling apart. You know what the anchor is? The one thing that never changes? God. God is our anchor. It's His truth that we are to live by. Please hear me here. If we get away from Him, we get away from the truth that He proclaims, it's just a matter of time. Everything's going to fall off the rails. And, and, and then everything then becomes very confusing. And then what follows next? Devastation. And it's what we're seeing happening with families and individuals, with our culture. Things are beginning to not just be frayed, they're beginning to fall apart. We listen to the message and we go, what in the world is going on? Have we lost our minds? We've become untethered from the consistent eternal truth, God, His teachings in the Word. See, hope, health, wholeness comes when we go to God, when we do it His way. When we don't do it His way, no wonder it leads to darkness. No wonder it leads to death. And we see it right here in the Scriptures, right here in the Lord's Prayer we see it. Here on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says what? When you pray, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, God calls us to honor him. The title Father, it's a, a title that, that uh, elicits prominence and authority in our lives. It's a protector. He's a leader. He's a, a guide in life. He knows. He's been there. He's the all-wise one. And as the heavenly Father, he is to have authority in our lives. Why? Because he's the all-powerful one. He is the creator of it all. He is the one who is holy, good, and just. And as the heavenly Father, he protects us. That's what this story's all about. We messed it up. We rejected him in his ways. It brought in sin, which brought in death. Now we're in devastated situations. And, and, and God brings us Jesus, who comes to confront sin and death at the cross. And he proves that he not only confronted it, but he defeated them. How? By raising from the dead three days later. How much more proof do you need? And when we accept who he is and what he's done for us, we're forgiven all of the sin. All the punishment we deserve, it's put on Christ. We're cleansed. We're reconnected in a spiritual, eternal relationship with our Father in heaven. Not to live here, but to live with him. 
And as our heavenly father, he leads us and guides us with his truth. And so we're therefore to seek his kingdom and his will done in our lives. And we're to forgive as he's forgiven. We're to treat others the way we want to be treated. See, he's the anchor. Living his way brings life, brings wholeness and health not only with us and God, but with us and others. And sometimes doing his way is hard. Sometimes it's going to require sacrifice because we don't do it our way. We die to our ways and live to his ways because it's really all about him and his ways. His ways are life and truth. He is life and truth. But it all starts with God's call to forgiveness between us and him and then extended between us and others. If, if we're going to be powerfully used by God on this earth, then we need to deal with others properly. And, and if we're going to forgive, then we first must experience forgiveness from him to us. And that's why we all need Jesus. It doesn't come apart from Jesus. Jesus turning to him, putting our faith and trust in him, who he is, what he did for us at the cross. See, at the cross, it all becomes perfectly clear that none of us can be good enough on our own. So we have to put our faith and trust in him because he alone is the good enough one. And he proves it by raising from the dead. See, Jesus puts all of us on the same footing. Nobody on another tier. We're all on the same footing. We have to place our trust in Jesus Christ. And none of us can boast because we did anything ourselves, which means everybody, everyone has equal value to God. Everybody. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, everybody has equal value to God. Patricia Miller tells a story about being a nurse and working at the emergency room. Um, as she continued to work there year after year, she became more and more calloused in light of everything she experienced and saw. At about the five-year mark, she didn't even see people anymore. She just saw situations that she needed to do paperwork for. She just saw numbers. It was her job, so she processed them. One night, uh, she was doing intake for a young woman who had attempted suicide, and she uh, was taking the information about this woman from the woman's mom. It was the middle of the night. Police had found the daughter and then rushed her to the hospital, contacted the mother. The mother obviously was distraught. distraught. She was disheveled. It was 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. She struggled to answer questions as Patricia would ask. Patricia kept thinking to herself, hurry up, lady, hurry up. Aver aggravated with little patience, she grabbed the health care cards and made copies as quick as she could, grabbed the cards, gave them back to the mother, and right as she gave them to the mom, something said, look at her. And she realized she had been through this entire intake process and hadn't even looked at this mother. Their eyes hadn't even met. So she looked up and saw a woman who was very broken, tears streaming down her face. And Patricia began to feel God's heart for her and her daughter. She just stopped what she was doing and bowed her head and said, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm so sorry that I've become this way. She got up from her chair. She walked around the counter. She sat next to that mother. She covered her hands on her lap with her own hands. And she looked her in the eyes and she said, I care. Don't give up. The mother began to just weep 
as she told the story of her daughter and the rebellious nature and their single mom life that she's lived for so many years. And after a few minutes when she dried her tears, she looked at Patricia and thanked her for listening. Patricia said this, my attitude changed that night. The God who so loved the world broke the self-imposed barrier that I had erected around my own heart. Now, he can reach out to me and through me. We live in a crazy world, and life can definitely be incredibly hard. And there are needs all around us. Maybe we've even intentionally thrown up our hands and thought to ourselves, you know what, I don't care anymore. There's nothing I can do anyway. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you resigned yourself in a hurt condition. I know we live in crazy times. And I know things can feel very dark and devastating. But I want you to know something. There is an anchor. It's God. His truth found in Jesus Christ in the teachings of his word. He is life. His truth endures through the ages, no matter what happens. His love endures. He never gives up. He never runs out on us. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, God loves you. And although that might feel weird in this day, might feel weird here and that, isn't it a message that needs proclaimed? How much more stronger would it be if we could be received that there is a God of truth that loves and cares deeply for us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to forgive you. He wants to lead you to life. He wants you to lead you to the light. But it all begins with this call to forgiveness, to accept his forgiveness. He wants to do a work in each of us so that he can do a work through each of us. But it begins by going to him. The eternal, sure, and consistent one that never changes, no matter how much things do here. Let's bow together. Father, thank you that you are consistently there. You continue to provide, Lord, for our greatest needs. Our greatest need being forgiveness and a relationship restored to you. Help us, Lord, today. No matter where we are, help us to see you. Because in you, all our needs can be met. In your strength, Lord, give us direction. Lord, some here maybe are feeling pain, but you can provide hope. Lord, you continually call each of us to know you, to know your forgiveness, be changed, and to share it. Even now, Lord, you're drawing people to you all over this world. And if you're working in our hearts and our lives, even right now, Lord, I pray that we would turn to you, that we would know your truth, accept it, own it, and allow it to set us free. Even right now, Lord, may people reach out to you in prayer and say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me. I want to do life your way. Where they can begin anew, they can be forgiven, they can be a forgiver. They can experience healing and sharing it by treating others the way they would like to be treated. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.